to her aunt. Yeah. I've just started reading my grandmother's letters from 1898. Oh, wow. And a lot of them are not too readable. She died young. Uh, but I'm really interested to hear what you're going to tell us about your mom. Because <laughs> it's, there's just 1947. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a number of interesting things um, that I get to hear when I'm giving this presentation to, to different people. Um, because a lot of people say, I've got World War II letters too, or I've got letters that my mother or father or grandmother or grandfather, depending on the timeline, uh, wrote to each other during the war, yada, yada, yada. Some people say, I'm afraid to read them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a little surprised at that at first, mm -hmm. although I guess it seems kind of private between those two people, but they're not around anymore. Would you really not think that they would want you to read them? You know, um, one one of the places that I that I spoke, a woman said she was the oldest of four children, and her parents had written back and forth during the war. And he came back from the war, and, and they got married, and had four children, and they said they were going to keep their letters to each other, they kept on both sides, they kept bo both sides of their letters, they were going to keep them, and on their 50th <coughs> wedding anniversary, they were going to reread them to each other, and then burn them. Oh. <laughs> but they only made it to 48 years. Oh. But the oldest daughter has them all. And I said, have you read them? And she said, no. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and she says, and none of my siblings are going to care. Mm. And I suggested maybe that, you know, every family is different, you know, so I can't really say. But I, I said, wouldn't it be great sometime on your parents' wedding anniversary, you get everybody together, all the generations that are coming, and do it then and read them then. And to other people I've suggested, if you don't feel comfortable reading them, maybe you have someone trusted, uh, a friend or a relative that you can use as a surrogate and say, you read them first and you tell me if there's something that I don't really want to know, then I won't read it. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Let them be a That's filter a, a little bit mm -hmm. if you're really afraid. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've, I've been surprised at how many people don't want to read them because they're afraid of what they're going to find out 70, 80 years later. So the fact that you're reading more than 100 years old letters is, is pretty neat. Yeah. And her handwriting is okay? Um, it's difficult to understand. This is my grandmother writing to her son who lived in Florida at the time. And I, it's hard. I, I'm really struggling to read the handwriting, but I... I've read so many now that I'm, I don't know why they were kept. I, really, I mean, it's a very long time to keep letters from a grandmother. And my, my grand, actually grandmother, was my great grandmother, my grandmother was dying at the time of um, a kidney failure. And there was some graphic detail about that. I always wondered how she died. So it was, that's been interesting to me, but it's not terribly clear, but it's in pencil, which is amazing. Oh, wow. I, I yeah, read them. yeah, it's amazing. I can read wow. them at all. Are there interesting really? postage stamps on the, the um, A couple of them have very interesting postage Maybe stamps. Maybe they were saved for the stamps if someone was a stamp collector in the family? I don't know, because some of them are cut out. The stamps are cut out. Somebody mm -hmm. saved stamps. Somebody saved stamps, but then there are some that still have stamps on them. I have no idea of the value, because I, I can hardly read them, but they are over 100 years old. So, yeah, mm. yeah amazing. And not in acid-free containers either. I mean, right. there's no, there was nobody, no preservation. Nobody kept wow. any of these that's, things in acid-free containers. No. There were no acid-free containers. No. no one, no one thought about that. No stuff. electricity. <laughs> well, there's that. <laughs> there's that. Yeah. Okay, we're ready. Yep. Okay. Well, welcome to the Dover Free Library and to tonight's program, Reconstructing History and Genealogy: Mom's World War II Letters. Corinne Smith, our guest speaker, is a writer who is originally from Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. She served for several years on the board of the Blair County Genealogical Society in Altoona, Pennsylvania. 
The first book she compiled was a self-published family history titled From Saxony to the Lehigh Valley, The Descendants of the Ludwig Hossfeld. Uh, <laughs> since then, she ha has written several books about American author Henry David Thoreau. She is a former librarian and lives in Gardner, Massachusetts. And also like to say that Corrine was our guest speaker at last year's Dessert Social. She's, this is the author of the book, West Would I Go Free? Tracing the Rose's Last Journey. And she gave an extensive talk on him last year, and it was a great talk. And let's welcome Corinne to the Dome Free Library. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be back in Dover. I had a magical, mystical experience coming down the mountain last year <laughs> in rain and rainbows and all kinds of things. And so this is a special place. And so I'm, I'm honored and pleased to be back in Dover. And so what I'm going to talk about tonight are letters that I found that my mother had. And this is a, a topic about history and genealogy and that time period in the 40s and this time period now. And it's really all about people. And uh, like I said, people then, people now. and. Um, I think it's a compelling story. It, it happens in Pennsylvania. It doesn't happen in Vermont. Um, but I think it can be relevant to what other people have in their attics and family boxes and that kind of thing. So we'll see how it goes. Um, so we'll be, we'll be in Allentown, Pennsylvania for part of this and in Europe and in the Pacific for part of this. And uh, we'll see how it goes. The basic story is that I'm an only child, and both of my parents are gone. I'm divorced, no kids. I did genealogy in the 80s before the internet. So I had traced the family trees on both sides. But because I'm an only child and I'm it, I have the family boxes. <laughs> so. I was living in Pennsylvania the uh, last couple of years taking care of my father, and um, that was a good thing. We had two and a half years at the end together, and that was, that was a good thing to do. And I knew I wanted to come back to New England. So last year, last summer, last spring, last summer <clears throat> in 2017, I was getting ready to move back to New England, to central Massachusetts specifically. And so I started looking at all the stuff I was going to bring back and figuring out what to weed out and sell or donate or do I need, you know, and looking in boxes. And I came upon this box. Oh my gosh. And <clears throat> this was a familiar box. It had stamps written across the top of the lid because my father's stamp collection was in it. He had two notebooks, one for the United States, one for international stamps, and he had collected stamps since he was a, a little kid. And we always cut stamps off of letters. That's why I asked you if you, if you uh, had some, a stamp collector in your family. So it had stamps written across it, and I, I knew it had my father's stamp collection in it, along with a whole bunch of first day of issue envelopes, um, that my father and my uncle used to collect whenever a stamp was issued. You know, you get an envelope that had it postmarked from a special place because of that stamp. So I knew that was in there. But I saw a little, when I was moving it around, I saw little envelopes that said War and Navy Departments hanging out of it, which I had not recognized. And so I brought it up. It was in the basement at the time. I brought it up and looked at what was in there, and it turned out to be, in addition to the stamps and the first day of issue envelopes, 170 letters dated from 1942 to 1945. Now, my mother had always said she died in 1993. She, when she would talk about that time period, she would say, oh, we all wrote letters to servicemen. We all wrote letters to the boys we knew, and we're friends of the family, and that's just what everybody did. You know, it was, it was no big deal. I had never heard that we still had these things. That's the thing. So what I found out, I sorted them all out by who wrote them, and 
16 servicemen had written back to her. One of them was my uncle, so I knew him, but the rest I didn't know. Seven of them were from Allentown, which was her hometown. Four were from Tr Trenton, New Jersey, which was where her college roommate was from. Four were from Pittsburgh and probably her cousins. One I couldn't figure out. But there were also 54 letters from her to her mother and her sister because she was in her first year of college at the time. So I didn't have both sides of correspondence, but I had some very interesting things. And so I uh, tried to sort these out and looked at people's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zip across here for a minute, looked at people's uh, names and everything, and none of the names really, really uh, came out at me. None of, the, none of the names really made too much sense to me, although a lot of them were German. And we had Pennsylvania Dutch, which is German ancestry, and there were a lot of Pennsylvania Germans in the, in the area. And so maybe they kind of sounded familiar. I wasn't sure. But what I decided was to try to track down the families of the soldiers. Because if somebody had letters from one of my ancestors, I think I'd want to know. So that's what I did. And that's what led me to meet these people. So that's the short version of, of the story. So now we'll hear some details. My, um, we this as close as we can, maybe. That's good. So this is, this is my, me and my parents in early 70s probably. Uh, my father, Louis Hosfeld, and my mother, Jeanette Banzoff, although her first name was Myrtle. She did not go by Myrtle, uh, except one of my uncles used to call her Mert just to get her irked, you know. So, um, so the, that's us. That's us. This is about her family. So she was one of four children, and so they were the Banzoffs in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And... She was the youngest of four. The oldest was Aunt Bert, but everybody called her Bill, who knew her. Next in line was Charles, but everybody called him Bud. I know I have seen a picture of him in his army uniform that my cousins have, but haven't gotten to me yet because they're not as interested in this as I am. The only picture I could find of him was him making a face in the back of a family picture, but that pretty much encapsulates his personality anyway. <laughs> so that's Uncle Bud. And then Uncle John was next, and then my mother, Jeanette. Now, there's two years between all the ones except for seven at the end, so she was the baby of the family, and she uh, was always treated like the baby of the family. At least from what I saw as a uh, young person. And then more people in the family, my grandmother, their mother, Anna. Now this is a much older picture in the 60s, well, probably in 58 or 59, because that's me she's holding. Her husband, the children's father, died in the early 1930s of thyroid cancer. So she was raising four children in the Depression by herself. And I don't know how she did that. And I asked my mother and my aunt when I was doing genealogy, you know, how did you survive? And I don't really know. And she said, you know, everybody was poor, so we all were dealing with it, so it wasn't a big deal. I guess their mother took in laundry and did sewing and that kind of thing. Another important player in the in the family was Teddy the dog. Okay, got two pictures of Teddy, and they lived in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And if you uh, need a geographic prod here in southeastern Pennsylvania, Philadelphia is here. Allentown is up there next to Bethlehem. We lived in Lancaster. So both of my parents were from the Allentown area. Mom was from the city. My father was from a farm and farming community outside. 
<clears throat> Lancaster's down here and York is over there. York plays into this picture as well. If you remember Billy Joel's song, Allentown, that pretty much speaks about the, the town too. It was um, mostly blue collar, it was mostly German descent, um, ancestry, mostly German and Italian at the time. Today, it's like any city, is much more diverse. There were about 100,000 people then, about 120,000 now. This is a contemporary skyline. Nothing is taller than the PPNL building which is Pennsylvania Power and Light. So it's the electric company for the region. And it was the major employer of the region. It's the tallest building. It's um, at the top, like the Empire State Building lights up different lights at night. The PPNL building does too, and you can see it anywhere in the valley. And uh, that's how you know where you are. <laughs> <laughs> The Bantoffs lived on Madison Street, 35 Madison Street on that side of this duplex. And I found this really neat picture of my mother, Jeanette, and her sister, Bertha, and Teddy the dog on that stoop, on that stoop, exactly. I tried to stand in front of it and hold it and get the picture so that it was, you know, so that it would be right in there. But that didn't happen. But you can see it pretty well. And different things in their lives. They had to walk about eight really long city blocks to get to school, Allentown High School. There was only one high school that served the, the big city, and you walked. There were city buses, but that would have cost money. Nobody had money. So you walked. And now Allentown's big enough to support two high schools, so this one is now called William Allen High School. And, of course, the other place that they walked to, is I don't think they had a car in the family, was Christ Lutheran Church on Hamilton Street. Hamilton Street's the big main street in Allentown. Lots of Lutheran churches in Allentown. This one was the biggest. And, um, in fact, um, because it was my mother's church, when I was born, even though I was born down in Lancaster, when I was baptized, I was baptized in that church. Oh, and I should have put that picture. And I have a picture of Ampert, Ampert and Uncle John were my godparents, and I have a picture of them holding me as a little... Oh, well. So I had a picture before of those letters, and the, some of the letters were regular kinds of airmail letters, but some were these tiny ones at the bottom which are V-mail. And V-mail looks like this. Anybody ever see these? No. So what happened was that the soldier was given a regular sheet of paper, like eight and a half by 11, and he either wrote on it or typed on it, and then the War and Navy Department would microfilm it and send it back to the United States on microfilm, I guess, so that they wouldn't have to deal with all of that kind of letters. You know, so many people, I mean, if all of these people are writing back and forth, that's a tremendous amount of paper and tonnage and hauling it around in bags or anything. So I guess microfilm was logically the technology of the day and easier for them to handle it. And then when they got back to the States, they printed it, although it was this big, and put it in these tiny envelopes. <laughs> and that's what you got. This one's addressed to my grandmother. Um, these are all uh, some of my uncle's letters, and I'll pass them around. But it also had the added benefit that when they did that, they could also censor. So you can see a couple of the, uh, a couple of the uh, lines down there are blacked out. So don't know what he was saying. He was based in Hawaii, so I don't know what he was saying, but it was something that they thought was private enough to uh, warrant, you know, blocking it out. So I will pass them around so you can see what that's like. I don't think he divulges any family secrets in those. And so that's what, that's what those look like. Come on in and have Sorry, a seat. Late. That's okay. Yeah, so we've got the, the letters and the V-mail. Now we'll go back. <coughs> I didn't know that. 
go back to mom, and I have her high school yearbook and her college yearbook over here and a, and a picture of her. She was in the class of 44, and this is from her yearbook. And like a lot of yearbooks at the time, they always had a slogan to describe the person. And the slogan for her is, a babbling brook is never still. And that pretty much encapsulates my mother as I knew her. She was a chatty gal. She was an extrovert. She was involved in a lot of things. Whereas my father and I sort of held back and were introverts. And so she was the domineering force in our, in our household in the 60s, 70s, 80s. She was in choir. She was in historical society. She was in Latin club. And it says in here, to be a good nurse is what Jeanette wants, and she will be good medicine to all her patients. After her training period, she would like to enlist as a Navy nurse. Good luck, Jeanette. Okay. So she was in the class in 1944, so the war was already going on for several years, obviously. And so how did the Banzoffs, these are her siblings, deal with the war? Well. Ampert, known as Bill, was the oldest, so she had gotten a job as a secretary for the local transportation highway department. PennDOT is what it grew into, Pennsylvania Department of Transportation. But, so she was a secretary with the local highway department office, so she had a pretty good job. And so she was bringing in money and supporting my grandmother, her mother. And I, she never got married and took care of her mother for the rest of her life. Uncle Bud was in the Army and he was stationed in Hawaii. Uncle John was in the Army and he was stationed in Philadelphia with a, a job on this side of the ocean because he had a childhood accident and had uh, was missing an eye, had a glass eye, so he wasn't allowed to go overseas. So that leaves my mother, and we'll get to what she chose to do with, uh, for the war effort. Also, um, Bill was an air raid warden in Allentown, and she got to wear a helmet, and she got to go around and tell people when there was a practice run to lower their shades and turn off their lights and all that kind of stuff. So they were all involved. My grandmother, Anna, um, probably knitted they, they said they would knit socks and sweaters and scarves, and they would knit things for, for soldiers, too. Teddy, the dog, had the best job of all, the best duty, the best responsibility. The family lore goes that the children made a hat for Teddy and put stars on it. And he always had one more star than General Eisenhower had. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and when the boys would come home from the war, he would wear the hat and he would salute them, and they would salute him back. <laughs> so that is, the, that is the story of Teddy. So what was Jeanette going to do with all of these patriotic people when everybody was participating in all this kind of stuff? She chose the United States Cadet Nurse Corps. Now, what this was, was a federal program to subsidize colleges and hospitals to train nurses because there was a nursing shortage at the time, both here and overseas. So they needed nurses desperately. So what they did, what the federal government did, was give money to the colleges and hospitals to train all these nurses. And they could come into those programs for free. That's the only way Jeanette got to do this, because there's no way her family could have afforded to send her to nurses training or college or anything. So she chose the University of Pennsylvania, down in Philadelphia, and um, and so here she is. This is from her yearbook over here. And it was a three-year program. You got an RN. And you were also in the Cadet Nurse Corps. You had a uniform, that kind of thing. One of her roommates is still alive, and I've been able to talk to her. She's very, very coherent. She, she's in her mid-90s. And she, she sat down with me and told me all about the program. 
she said there was a commitment you were supposed to go through this three-year training and then you were supposed to at least work as a nurse for a year in order to pay the government back so to speak but this was 1944 and the war ended in 45 and the program only really continued for another year or two and so it just kind of faded away and there wasn't really no I said was there a follow-up or you know they checked on you and she said oh, no, no. Um, she said by that time most of the women a lot of the women maybe not most had found hospitals and never did work as nurses so it was a good idea and it got a lot of people trained as a nurse for free um, she and my mother both worked at the University of Pennsylvania Hospital for many years after that uh, I think mom worked there for eight years before she met my father and moved away to Lancaster. She had stories from working in the hospital. Uh, C. Everett Coop was one of the doctors on staff at the time. He eventually, of course, became the Surgeon General, was always on TV talking about the dangers of cigarettes, uh, which was ironic because she smoked. Uh, but everybody did. and. Um, also, she also got to take care of Jimmy Stewart's father. For some reason, he would, Jimmy Stewart was from Indiana, Pennsylvania, which was from the western part of the state. But his father was sick with something and got sent to Philadelphia for treatment. And she used to tell the story that she got to talk to Jimmy on the phone and tell him, and give him an update on his father. And she said he talked just like on the phone, just like he does in the movies. And so every time we watched It's a Wonderful Life, and oh, talks just like he did on the phone. So those are those are some of the those are the uh, some of the fun personal stories of this. So let me get to the letters. That night when I separated everything out, uh, I put them by name, and so. Roy Schmoyer sort of sounded familiar to me. And there were four letters. The first three were V-mail, that little stuff. And then the last one was a handwritten letter on regular paper. And the first three were actually addressed to Aunt Bert, known as Bill. And this last one was to my mother, addressed as Dear Little One. Evidently, everybody called her Little One since she was the baby of the family. I hadn't known that. I have a cat that I call Little One, so I hadn't known that. But anyway, so this first one is dated the 3rd of August, 1944, and it says, Dear Bill, you've probably been in contact with my home and know all the dirt by now. Your letter to me, your letters to me since June 28th are still in France and didn't reach me yet. Well, anyway, I was in that business, but have no fear about any French girls on my string. I was too busy to look twice at them. Everybody would, these were not flirty letters back and forth. Everybody wrote to these guys because they knew them and they always said, oh, I bet you, you know, you're after the French girls or I bet you you're after the English girls. And they all wrote back and said, it's not like that. It's not like that. None of them married somebody that they met somewhere else. But that seems like an awful long time ago now after being in the hospital. It surely is strange to be so inactive, and I have hopes of getting out soon. I am not walking yet, but with treatment and exercise, it should come quickly. So he's been hurt, but he's not telling us why and how, because he's not allowed to. As to your bowling, I admit you are getting better. This is a clue. He knows this family because Bill was an avid bowler. But you must improve still more. Get that average up higher. You can give John and myself some competition. So he knows her brother John, my uncle. By the way, I haven't heard from John for a long time. Where is he now? Da -da 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 -da. Congratulations to little one on graduation. I guess she is far from a little one now. Give my regards and love to everyone. So he knows the family. You can tell. He knows the family. And the next two letters, he's getting better. He's rehabilitating. He's walking and doing things. And then um, the fourth letter to my mom, little one, um, I just finished writing a letter to Bud and really didn't say much of interest. I guess you noticed that my letters seem dead, but due to censorship, etc., and being ETO, 
happy for so long, you can easily diagnose it as growing old with Uncle Sam away from home. So it's just, you know, it's just, you know. Well, anyway, I thought, okay, I want to, I want to find these people. Yes. I have a question about. I'm confused about the female. I know nothing about this. So this is written in longhand. Yeah. And somehow it gets transcribed into a type. It gets, it gets microfilmed, and so, then brought back, and then printed on little pieces of paper. But I found that if you put it on a copier and bounce it up to 200%, you get, you can get it, get it on a uh, regular. So, so some of it was V-mail and some of it was regular mail. But this says female and it's a longhand. Well, so, it, some of it, my uncle, some of my uncles were typed because he was working as a secretary somewhere, so he, so he had access to a typewriter. Um, so I guess it, it, it's just the format of it. It wasn't anything more special. Everything went through a sensor anyway, whether it was microfilmed or on, on longhand regular. Um, that's all. That's all I know. They could, they could write in those days. They could write in <laughs> nice handwriting. They, all the handwriting's different. Wait till you see. Yeah. Uh, so, so that night I thought, okay, let's start with Roy Schmoyer, and so I put Roy Schmoyer into uh, an online search and put Allentown because what I was banking on, and you sort of have to do this when you're when you're doing research, you have to kind of divorce yourself from the emotion of it. Uh, I'm just assuming that a lot of these people have passed away. And so I was hoping for a newspaper obituary. And I was hoping for a really good, well-written one that would have right, correct names and dates, and a spouse's name, and parent's name, and a list of survivors so that with their where they lived, so I could track them down. So it's sort of at the mercy they're sort of at the mercy of newspapers now because now they usually digitize them or they they go they have gone back and digitized some and now sometimes they they sign on with programs like legacy.com where it just shows you part of it unless you pay for all of this research I just did what was out there for free so I I put Roy Schmoyer into the Thing, and I got his obituary from 2010 from the Allentown Morning Call, the newspaper there. And it does say he was the husband of Gertrude Bauer Schmoyer, who resides at Phoebe Terrace, which is a senior facility in Allentown. Uh, it says where he went to school. It said he attended William H Allen High School. Technically, that's wrong. He went to Allentown High School, but okay. Um, and he was in the U.S. Army 115th. Infantry, 29th Division of World War II. He was a longtime employee of Western Electric in Allentown. His wife is still living. His daughter is Dr. Martha Schmoyer Lomonico of Bridgeport, Connecticut. So I thought, okay, well, let's see if Gertrude is still around. And I found her obituary right away when I searched for her. She died in 2016. You know, it mirrors his, you know, it, it matches his right down to the survivors, the daughter, Dr. Martha Schmoyer Lomonico of Bridgeport, Connecticut. That's a very unique name. So I thought, okay, Martha Schmoyer Lomonico, we'll look her up and see if we find her. And bingo, she's a professor at Fairfield University in Connecticut. She's a theater person and she changed her last name to Lomonico. So she was easy to find. And since she's a professor, and it's an educational site, there's her email address. <laughs> wow. <laughs> there's her email address. So I'm think, looking at that thinking, okay, what do I say? I have four letters from your father from the 1940s. Wow. You know? So I thought about that for a little bit. And so I emailed her. It's right on there, so why not? So I, I came up with a standard email, and for the other people that I contacted, it was by letter, because I only had physical addresses. So I said, uh, hello from Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. You and I are evidently in the same age range. Oh, and I put World War II letters from Roy Schmoyer in the subject line, so she wouldn't think that this is, you know, a Nigerian prince offering 50. <laughs> 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 so... 
you and I are evidently the same age range. We have similar roots. I started looking through this box of correspondence. I found four letters from your father from 1944, 1945, that he wrote either to my mother, Jeanette Banshoff, or to her sister, Bertha. All of them were from Allentown. Roy was a sergeant in the Army. I gave him her a little bit of background about the four siblings of the Banshoffs and their names. And I said, evidently your father was injured, spent time in the hospital. He's not more specific about this. My mother was living in Philadelphia. She was en enrolled in the nursing program at the University of Pennsylvania. She wrote to a fair number of soldiers, it seems, and she kept all of their answers. Yours are the first letters where I've been able to track down a survivor. Would you like me to send these letters to you? None of these people are around to give or deny permission anymore, and I don't think there are any secrets revealed that anyone would be embarrassed by. I'd be happy to mail them to you. I only wish I had looked in this box 20 years ago. So I sent it, and it was late that night. I had been sorting these letters and trying to figure out what to do, and I just uh, went to bed and uh, left it up to the fate, so whether she was going to read her email overnight or not. So the next morning when I looked at my email, I had gotten a reply from her, but it was an automatic reply because she was on sabbatical for the semester. <laughs> And it was one of those ones that said, you know, I'm on sabbatical, I'll only be checking this sporadically, if you need immediate attention, call the department, I'm like, oh, I don't know. if we've waited this long, I guess, you know, it depends on whether she reads it or not, no, no. oh well, um, we've waited this long, and that's fine. So, later that day, I did get another email from her, and uh, she's... She's very astute. She's a college professor. And she says, I'm on sabbatical this semester and I'm actively avoiding my university email to try to stay in research writing sabbatical mode, but I dip in occasionally and just discovered your remarkable letter sent yesterday, which has brought tears to my eyes. Thanks so much for taking the time to track me down. I would love to hear how you have done so. I know that the internet is a powerful tool for making astonishing reconnections. Well, it really only took three clicks to find her. <laughs> when you have a unique name, that's what happens. Uh, she re says, I distinctly remember the name John Banzoff, my uncle. Although I don't know that we never met, he was one of my father's groomsmen at my parents' wedding in mm -hmm. Allentown in 1953. Mm -hmm. I didn't know of his friendship with your mother or aunt. This is, this is savvy. I'm sure that in those days, conventional married men and my dad certainly was one of those, did not retain friendships with women other than their wives, alas. <laughs> but it's wonderful to know that she was a close friend and correspondent while he was abroad during the war. He didn't meet my mother until several years later when they were both working at Western Electric in Allentown. So yeah, that makes perfect sense. So all these women were writing back and forth, but of course once they got back and real life kicked in, they weren't going to keep, you know, they were just family friends. It wasn't anything intimate. Anything. But here's what we learn when we find out more. My father was wounded in the fourth wave of the D-Day invasion. Mm -hmm. That's why he couldn't talk about it. He has a purple heart. I did a six-hour oral history with him when Stephen Ambrose was requesting that fellow historians help him procure first-hand accounts of the invasion. I retained a copy of the tapes and sent the originals to Ambrose's archive. I'll never forget the day we sat down to hear his story. It was both fascinating and harrowing, as you might imagine. Interestingly, his memory skipped directly from being on the ship to Normandy and then back in the hospital in Britain. Having done my homework prior to the oral history, I'm thankful that I didn't jar what must have been an unspeakable and unimaginable trauma wading through the bloody body-strung waters of Omaha Beach by the time my father arrived. Mm -hmm. So, wow. Uh, you would, I you had no idea from his standpoint of the letters. And so that's when I decided, you know, maybe we need to honor these people, our parents, and sit down and talk about them. And I thought, as much as possible, I want to meet these people. And we need to talk and sit and talk about uh, things. So I drove up to Bridgeport, Connecticut, and I met Marty and her partner, Carl. Marty, like me, is an only child, doesn't have any, anybody else to hand things to, so she's got all the family records. So here's Roy's high school uh, entry from the class of 37. He's already interested in science and engineering, and 
I said, where did they live? And she told me 228 Northwest Street, which was on the way to Allentown High School. So I'll bet you when John and Bud walked to school, they picked up Roy along the way. And I could just imagine them doing that. And um, here's Marty and Carl. And here is, she's got everything, so here's their, her parents' wedding picture. Here's John, my uncle, on the side. And then there's another one where he's, he's in, uh, he's the second one in from the right on that one. And, and as Roy alluded to in that first piece of uh, correspondence, he was an avid bowler. Here he is tallying the results from his team, and evidently he was a fan of the bow tie. <laughs> so this was him at Western Electric. So Marty and I posed with her picture of her father and my picture of my mother, and uh, honored them and had a, had a good time talking about Allentown and, and uh, all, of the, all of the people and um, the fact that these people knew each other. And that was fun. That was fun. And I was kind of hoping they would all go like that, but you no, know, they don't all go like that. The next one I tried to, to look up was Donald Eitner. And so you can see you can see his letters. And he's got even personalized stationery uh, for the Air Corps, excuse me, for the Army Air Corps. So he was in England and he was evidently a supply person of some kind. Roy Schmoyer was too. Roy was not supposed to be on the front line. So the fact that he was in the fact that he was in the D-Day invasion meant that they really needed people to to be on Omaha Beach. So Donald writes uh, I always remember you as Bud and John's sweet little sister, and here you are grown up in what seems like overnight. So he knows the family. I could tell right away. I could ask you a million questions about Allentown High. Are the kids still crazy as ever? How was graduation exercise? Did you go to any basketball, football, or baseball games? Or perhaps get to some of the dances? I sure liked high school and wish I was back there right now. Believe I could even sit through a class in trigonometry. All these they were all young people, you know, and they were mostly really right out of school, and so here they're dealing with all this stuff. I'm glad to hear Bud and John are both getting along fine, can say ditto for me too, although I know a certain place where I would get along a lot finer, three guesses. I do quite a lot of bicycle riding in the evenings around the English countryside, I often stop in at a dance at one of the surrounding towns. They are a bit boring though and the music is corny to say the least. Some of the girls are fairly good dancers but I wouldn't trade one American gal for a hundred English and I really mean it. We also have a swell Red Cross aero club on the base which gives a dance every Wednesday night with a very good band made up of American soldiers. On all sides everybody used the word swell um, in, in a lot of these letters. Everything was swell which was pretty fun. Mom must have written back to him because I, after reading some of her letters to her mother, she was talking about, she was telling everybody all about the courses she had to take, the anatomy and all this kind of stuff, and the things that they had to dissect, which I would prefer not to have known about, which I did skip over, <laughs> and I didn't read in detail. Um, so she must have talked about that in one of her letters to him. And he wrote back and said something about cats and dogs and said, I guess Teddy is about four or five years old now. So he knows, he even knows the dog, so he knows. <laughs> Remember the time he got struck by a car in front of your house? Much excitement at 35 North Madison Street for a while. She never told me, I don't think, that he got hit by a car. He was evidently okay afterward. At what if, maybe she knew it, that I would have been disturbed by that. But he obviously knows the family, so okay. So I tried the same thing, and I, I looked for him in Allentown, and I didn't find an obituary. I kept finding an address, and I thought, I think he's still alive. But having just gone through with my father and memory issues, and 
sudden anger at things coming up from the past that you didn't expect, maybe? I didn't think I necessarily wanted to write to him if he was still alive. So I kept on digging a little bit and I did find his wife's obituary. And so she died in, she died early on, she died in 1984. And it said, surviving with her husband are two daughters, Nancy J, wife of Sid Grossman of Emmaus, and Patricia, wife of Jane's. Uh, Lionel Speck of Brownsville, they're both around Allentown. So I thought, okay, usually in an obituary, if somebody is really writing it the way they should, they do the children in order of age, the oldest first. So I thought I'd like to find Nancy Grossman, wife of Sid Grossman. And this was from 84, and I was crossing my fingers that Nancy and Sid Grossman were still married, or that if they were divorced, Nancy didn't change her name. Fortunately, she didn't change her name after they got divorced, and so I got to meet Nancy Eitner Grossman. Mm -hmm. And so, I was right, her father was still alive, but he really wasn't in um, a mental space where sending him the letters would have done much good. She appreciated them quite a bit. And we had a good time talking since she was going through some of the same kinds of things with her father that I had gone through with mine. And so I can tell you that this is Donald's high school yearbook picture. Uh, Allentown Public Library, you know, how, how resourceful public libraries are, especially big city ones. Um, they have a lot of the high school yearbooks from the past. They called him Peck because they thought he looked like Gregory Peck. <laughs> Not so sure. Not so sure. Peck is the boy you might hear singing a song in the halls or anywhere else around the school. He loves swing music and never fails to attend the annual school dances. And he's still dancing. He's over in Europe. He's over in England, riding around on his bicycle and going to dances. Um, you can count on him for a good basketball game. Da -da 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 -da. He also likes bright colors. Watch those striped socks he wears. He seems like an interesting guy. And so when I met her, I said, or maybe when I talked to her on the phone at first, I said, so where did he live? And she said, well, it was a sticky situation. His parents, something was going on with his parents, and I didn't want to dig. I don't need to know. Uh, but something was going on with his parents. So he lived with his grandmother at 31 North Madison Street, which was only two houses away from where the Banzoffs live. So of course he knew the whole family, of course he knew Teddy, of course he knew all of them. And she said, you know, he never wanted to celebrate Memorial Day or Veterans Day or be acknowledged that he was even in the service because he didn't get wounded like Roy Moyer or D-Day and he didn't mm -hmm. think that he was only in supply in England and he didn't think he had lent anything to the effort that really warranted special treatment. She said when her son was little and he had to do a biography report, he did sit down with his grandfather and he did talk a little bit about it, but she said he really downplayed it. He didn't really think that he deserved any of that stuff. And I said, but look at the letters. By the way, I gave them the physical letters back, but I scanned them and copied them before I gave them back. And I told them that I was might do something with them as a story, and they all accepted that. But I said he, he, had, he was doing something important enough that he had personalized stationery. Of course, he was using it for personal stuff, but he had personalized <laughs> stationery, you know? He was doing something important. So I think you could be proud of that, you know? So she and her sister were able to take him to Father's Day lunch last year. I don't know when this picture was taken, but this is Nancy and her sister and Donald, their father, and read him the letters and talk a little bit about it and not prod. And he did kind of remember the Bantoffs, and he did kind of remember, he didn't remember Teddy, I asked her to ask, but uh, he did remember riding his bicycle and doing the dances, and he does look like his this high school, high school yearbook. Now, I've been in contact with Nancy since, and 
back and forth occasionally, and I knew things weren't going very well, and in June she emailed me and, and said things weren't well with her father at all, and that um, she thanked, she, I'd, what she was going through, again, I'd gone through, so I understood, and she thanked me and said I had provided a lifeline that she hadn't expected and uh, a way to connect with her father. And she had told me when we met in person that I asked each person if they had a picture that they could loan to me, that I could scan or scan in a picture. And she said there was a perfect one of him in uniform that she knew where it was, but just because of circumstances that were going on last year, she wasn't able to get it. Um, so things weren't good in June and about a week and a half ago, she emailed me and she said, he's gone, here's the link to his obituary. And she finally was able to get the picture in uniform that um, she knew was, was really a nice one. And so she sent me the link to his obituary and I swear she must have been the one that wrote it. And I didn't tell her to, you know, to write anything, but she, this is, it was perfect. And it says that he's a World War II veteran and served with the 8th Air Force in the European Theater of Operations. And, and it was specific about that. And if you notice under the, under the picture, there's two dots. She had two pictures put in the obituary. And the other one is that one in uniform. So she felt the need, or at least her family and her, felt the need to honor him that way, even though he had not felt that way um, for most of his life since, since the war. So now all of the ones that I researched are gone, because he was, he was the last one. And I'm pleased that I was able to give her the letters before he was gone, and they were able to share. So that people, was his people. I'm sorry. The fourth line. Fourth line. Oh, this beagle. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. On the right. On the right. The On the right. Oh, his beagle. Oh, here. Let's go back. Dusty. Dusty. He had a beagle, Dusty. Who made it to the Yes, isn't that cool? <laughs> Keep that in mind, why don't you? <laughs> Naming pets. Well, you know, the survivors can, can be as extravagant as they want to now. You just have to pay column width for obituaries now. And so you can do whatever you want. I, I went to town on my father's one. I actually started writing it before he was gone. I, I, it was really long. It was expensive, but it had to be done. You know? um, so yeah, the beagle got in there. <laughs> How about them? Good catch, good catch. Uh, the next one was Paul Kemmerer, and his was a smattering of regular mail and V mail, but his is the only one that there were actually physical. Now, Ken, don't say a word. There were actually <laughs> physical things cut out of the second letter. Okay? So you see how his handwriting is. That's the date. So they took out the date, and they took out a word that we don't know exactly what it is, but he was in, that was from quartermaster school at Camp Lee, Virginia, but here, he's in the Navy, and he is at sea, and I think in some of these later letters, he's in Italy. And it says, it is most appropriate that I write to you in this my first hmm, at sea. You can see that there's a little tail that makes it, maybe the last letter was a Y. So I'm thinking maybe it was my first duty at sea. But really, if that's it, yes. mm. that doesn't tell you anything. No. And Ken was here earlier. Did you get my oil, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> that's why we're late. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. He's very perceptive. He says, no, um... Let me, let me read it from mine. I can read it from that, too. All kidding aside, though, thus far my trip has been perfectly swell. Swell. <laughs> swell weather, calm yeah. waters, and swell food. <laughs> really, tonight I had two helpings of sirloin steak and ice cream. Not bad. Eh, what? 
No, I haven't gotten seasick and never expect to. A great majority, unfortunately, have been sick, this having been their first experience on the ocean. I spent a lot of time reading, eating candy, and sleeping. Not much news at this time to hand down to you. Ken very astutely says... That? They blocked out some nonsense on top, but they let something go through, which the enemy could have gotten, which shows that the majority, the majority of the sailors couldn't do their duty because they were seasick. <laughs> You know, is this the U.S. fleet? And uh, you know, that they let go through. But they didn't let the word duty or mission go through. That makes sense. I think that's a, that's a valid point that I had never even thought of. That's, that's pretty cool. And then down here at the bottom, hey, John, imagine this. A carton of cigarettes costs only 45 cents. <laughs> Unbelievable, but true. These fellows are really filling up their personal supply, too. So the way he wrote his letters, he wrote it to, to Jeanette, and then he mentions... He says, hey, John, hey, Bertha, I guess you'll probably hear about me from time to time when you're up at the house. Please try to downplay any fears, etc., that my mother might have. Personally, I'm glad I got in on this trip. And Mrs. Banzoff, to you I say hello and lots of luck. You'll need it with Teddy, John, and Jeanette uh, uh, around. No kidding, though. Best wishes and happiness to the, to the entire lot of you. So he knows them all. He knows, he knows, knows Teddy. Teddy. Mm -hmm. He knows Teddy. So he knows them all. So I tried to find him, and the, his was a challenge. I thought Paul Kemmerer would be uh, uh, a unique enough name, not as unique as Martha LaMonico, but a unique enough name that I would find it. And I, I always paired it with Allentown because I figured if there's an obituary, it's going to at least say where he was born or where he went to high school because I'm, I'm sure all these people graduated from Allentown High, the ones I chose to research. And I ended up with somebody else, and I didn't think it was quite right, but I figured out somebody to write to. And when I wrote to these people, I wrote a version of what I read to you that I wrote to Marty. And... Um, I included a copy of the first letter, just in case, again, that they thought I was a Nigerian prince offering $50 million. I wanted to show that I had what I said I had. So that person called me and said, you got the wrong Paul Kemmerer. Well, that wasn't good. So I kept on researching a little bit, and eventually I found an obituary for his mother, Florence. And this was kind of hit or miss because she died in 73. And again, you're sort of at the mercy. Once you go back before in the 90s, you're sort of at the mercy of whether newspapers have digitized their stuff or not. If you're in that city and they have microfilmed their newspapers and have digitized their newspapers, a lot of times they'll, um, they'll have it available either on microfilm or in digital form in their library. I was up in Burlington on, on another task that has nothing to do with my family, but Burlington's library has, um, has all of their stuff back into the 1800s. It's terrific. So I could look up something that I know happened in Burlington in 1850 and get the newspaper report for it. it happens to be when Henry David Thoreau went through there on an excursion to Montreal. And I could get the name of the ferry that took them over to Plattsburgh from Burlington. <laughs> so, so big cities probably have them, but if you're doing this remotely and you don't have an Ancestry.com subscription and you don't want to go to a library that has one, you're sort of at their mercy. So it does say... Surviving our son, Paul A. of North Brunswick, New Jersey, which is why I couldn't find him in Allentown because he was in North Brunswick, New Jersey. So I tried to find him, and I really couldn't at first, but I did get him eventually, and I did get jo his daughter, Joanne Kammerer Schultheis, who lives in Florida. And so I didn't want to go all the way to Florida to give her the letters back. So we had a nice talk on the phone, and... I found out about Paul, and so here's Paul's high school yearbook, and they called him Dracula because they thought he looked like Dracula. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of famous people, so to speak, in Allentown High School. Um, see the high school's only woman hater. He walks, he talks, he's almost human, but to the fellows, Dracula is a real friend for he has the unusual habit of carrying never less than five dollars with him. If this capitalist wanted to live the rest of his life without working, all he would have to do would be to charge interest on all his loans. 
And if he'd collect his loans, he'd make Andy Mellon look like a peanut vendor. But just watch our miracle man sail through college and work himself into some executive position. So he already sounds as though he likes to deal with money and business and that kind of stuff. And I asked her where they lived. Or actually, it might have said in, in Florence's uh, obituary. And they lived at Linden Street in this house that has the big tree in front. And when you go under the tree, that's the, that's the front door way to the house. And Linden Street intersects with Madison. And the Banzoff's backyard almost intersected with this backyard, the Kemmerer's backyard. But what was really interesting was that Paul was dealing with a uh, a similar family situation to the Bansoffs and the Eitners. Um, his father was gone. His father had died. His mother and he were living in this house because she was the maid for the people who lived here, and which was John Henry and Dorothea Lay. Now, Ancestry, <coughs> Ancestry gives you some uh, teasers that you can get information online if you want the whole if you want the whole actual record you have to pay but you can at least get the thing and they misspelled their name they spelled it h e m m e r the census record person did not listen very well so Florence and Paul are living with Dorothy and John Henry Lay and it turns out these were movers and shakers in Allentown they had a big department store in Allentown. They were the first founders of the airport in Allentown, Bethlehem, Easton area. They had pilot's licenses, both of them. And they were very important people. And so John Henry was a surrogate father to Paul and teaching him about business and that kind of thing. And so he was a very handy person to have, have do this. And when I asked Joanne for a picture, she didn't send me one of her father. She sent me one of Dor Dorothea and John Henry Lay and these influential people who probably gave advice to all the other little young people in the area, too. And when I heard that name, it did sound, sound kind of familiar, like maybe my uncles had talked about him uh, on occasion, and I just didn't pay attention, and I just didn't know. And so Paul did go into business and was successful in North Brunswick, New Jersey. And knowing his connection with John Henry Lay, when I kept on looking for John Henry Lay of Allentown, turns out that his will, he left $200,000 to 13 different charities, including, uh, well, I don't know, all, all kinds of things including Paul Kemmer of North Brunswick, New Jersey, $20,000 less any outstanding loans. Kemmerer's mother worked for Lay and his first wife for years. So he even gave him money in his will, and it was publicized like that. So that was interesting. All of these, the, every story is different, obviously. Every family is different. So all of these people are coming from this one neighborhood. <laughs> That's a lot of money, 30 years ago. It was. It was. Not that bad today, but a lot of money 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I wouldn't mind getting that from somebody's will. No, it's not the 200. Yeah. Well, the 200 would have been better, yeah. I have to buy a lottery <laughs> ticket. On, I have to buy a lottery ticket on the way home. <laughs> and we'll see how that works. We'll see how that works. Um, the next person is Lawrence McKeever, and that's kind of a short story. He wrote to Bertha, my aunt. And it was a two-pager, a two-page V-mail that, this is the only one that was two pages. Dear Bertha, and right away I'm thinking, okay, he doesn't know her well enough to call her Bill, so I don't, I don't know. He's in Australia, and he's talking about all the plants that are growing, poinsettias are in bloom. He says the bush is about the size of our lilac bush back home. And he's talking about, about that kind of thing. He says, I'm being treated for a skin infection, and they, they would tell you what their maladies were, but they didn't have anything else to say. I don't think it's serious, but the treatment is a long, drawn-out process. Other than this, I have been, not been sick a day. I'm glad you like your new boss. I always liked Henry. I think he will make a good superintendent. He knows her from work. He knows her from the highway department. 
give him my regards and tell him I appreciate his offer and hope that I can take advantage of it. Bertha, you never did tell me who the new assistant superintendents are. So he knows her from work and it sounds as though maybe their former boss gave him a job offer when he came back. So he must have been a handy guy. Um, and then he says, I'm glad you like the souvenir something bracelet. He sent her a bracelet. He was much older than her, and this was not a flirty thing, but I guess if you got little trinkets from places, you could, you know, you send them to people. So, and my aunt never married, so, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't uh, in the works. So I found, I found Lawrence McKeever, and he was, you know, working for the highway department. He and his wife didn't have any children. So fortunately for this one, <coughs> whoever wrote this very succinct obituary in 86 at least put his parents' names. So I could make a little family tree and I could search his parents' names and find his siblings and see if he had any nieces and nephews who were still alive. And that's how I came upon Carol, his one niece. And so she was happy to get a letter from her favorite uncle, and she told me all about him, and he built his own house, and he was a very handy person, and so he must have been doing all kinds of construction kinds of things for whatever they were doing in Australia at the time. So that was an interesting side trip. Now, like, these are normal everyday people. There was a potential celebrity walking among the people in Allentown High School and he was two years older than my mother so she may have passed him in the hallway at one point and that's Lido Anthony Iacocca of the class of 42. <laughs> looks exactly, he's still alive, he looks exactly like that. Chrysler and Ford. Chrysler and Ford, not in that order, it's Ford and then Chrysler. Engineering, spelled wrong, but engineering and science, when you aim at anything, you are sure to hit it. Lee is a raconteur extraordinary, and not only can he quip with the best, but he can pun with the worst. If knowledge really is power, he is omnipotent. This, together with the ability he has developed in managing and directing school affairs, will prove a great asset in his career in engineering. <laughs> no he's president of the National Honor Society his senior year. He's in the debating society. He's on all kinds of things. He's on the play committee, he's on the, a manager of the swimming team. Um, potential, and they, they, you know, they may not have, you know, my, our band's office didn't know the Iacocos, but it's kind of interesting that they were all in the same place at the same time, and that they could, that they could do that. Now, let's go back to, I have one more person to tell you about, but let's go back to, Let's go back to my mother for a second. Question about Lee? Yeah. Well, just no. Just um, like every every school's got. Uh, Everybody has somebody famous. Somebody. Yeah. yeah. Everybody's got somebody famous. Yeah. So Jeanette. So I have these 54 letters from mom to her mother and sister back in Allentown. Now, she was in Philadelphia, but she was not stranded there. Uncle John had a car, and they went back and forth to Allentown almost every weekend. That didn't stop her from writing two or three letters every week. I don't know if they had a phone. I suspect not. And even if they did, that would have been a long-distance call. And you know, there was a time when we did not make long-distance calls. Do you remember that? <laughs> There was a time where you thought where you what time of day it was or whether you were going to make a long distance call. So these letters I'm introduced to my mother in a different way because as I said she was a commanding person, she was very outgoing and she ruled our house. I know that. But here she's only 17 years old. 18 17 and then 18 and she's away from home for the first time. She's tentative at some times. She asks her mother politely, can I bring Marilyn home with me? No, she's going through a bad time right now. Oh please mother, it would mean so much. And I'm thinking, what? And you know, the woman I know would have just said, I'm bringing Marilyn home. <laughs> she wouldn't have asked permission, but but she's away from home for the, la for the first time and so it's 
kind of it. But I see glimmers of the strong person that I knew, even in her first letter home. Evidently, there were so many nursing students that the university didn't have room for them to live, so they commandeered apartment houses in the city. And so she and her friends were living in an apartment house that still had regular tenants in it, but they were told to kind of make a lot of noise so those people would leave. <laughs> <laughs> and so that the college could take over, evidently, oh take, take over. There was a house mother who you were in by a certain time, lights out at a certain time, you could not leave until 7 in the morning if your train home was before that, too bad. So some people snuck out and got caught and all that kind of stuff. So, last night I almost caught a mouse. It was in apartment 2B and I'm in 5B. These girls were scared stiff of it and was only about an inch long, not including the tail. I took some Kleenex and got it by the tail, but it jumped into a closet. That's their hard luck, not mine. <laughs> That's my mother. You know, we still have tenants living here, so we are supposed to make all the noise we can. The quicker they get out, the quicker we get settled. The girls screamed when they found the mouse. Some crabby man came out and asked what was the matter. One girl said, it's a mouse. Then the jerk said, you little babies, afraid of a mouse. And he slammed the door. That's that. Well, I guess I'll have to close now. Miss Lynch will be in soon. See you Sunday. Well, and then, and like I said, she talks about her, she talks about her uh, anatomy classes and all the classes that she's taking. She talks about, um, all kinds of things. Uh, Marilyn Sykes is also going home on the 4 a.m. train. She's going to sneak out, and then when we leave, we'll sign her out from 7 to 10. That's really the only way she can get home. When I, when I, uh, when my mother's friend, who's still alive, who can, who was there at the time, said, "Oh wow, she snuck out the first year." I didn't go until our junior year. <laughs> like, wow, well, okay, you know. Uh, it's, a, it's okay as long as you don't get caught. Talking about getting caught, two girls got heck last night because they were up after 10.30 studying for a test. After 10.30, they went into the closet and closed the door. They were my two roommates, so I had to help them. I told them that you could see the light shining under the door. In fact, it was shining right in my face. Finally, Mrs. Harris came in the room. Right away, she said, there's a light on in the closet. I had forgotten about the side of the door. There's a crack. Then where are those two girls? I was giggling and my poor stomach was shaking. With that, she threw open the door and there was Joan and Trudy. She told them to stop their cheating. That it wouldn't help them anyway. They got into bed and Mrs. Harris went downstairs. All through the apartment, you could hear everybody laughing. I'm telling you, I could hardly keep quiet. Then they set the alarm for 6 o'clock and put it under my bed without my knowledge. When it went off this morning, I jumped up and couldn't find it. Finally, when I did find it, I couldn't shut it off. They just sat in bed and laughed. I was so mad that if it would have been their clock, I would have thrown it at them. No fooling. After all this confusion, they went back to sleep until 7.15. Boy, was I ripped up. She doesn't say in this one story that I remember her telling was that she learned how to short sheet a bed. You know how to short sheet a bed? Mm -hmm. She short sheeted everybody's bed on the floor except her own. So they all knew who did it. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the, so the, the rule is if you're going to do that, you do your own too. Okay, just for further. Yeah. By the way, if you want to, you can buy me a compact in the 5 and 10 cent store. My compact that Bill gave me broke. Just a cheap one. If you can't get cheap ones anymore, never mind. So they're asking for, she's asking for nylons and compacts and gloves and all kinds of different things. Did you catch the word there? I'm yeah, sorry? She said, all heck broke, break loose, all heck. Yeah, not, she didn't, not hell. she would not have sworn then, you know, later. But hell wasn't a bad word. I later mean, she would have. Well, you know, she's right to her mother, too. Maybe she said hell in, in real life, but she didn't say it in a letter to her mother. She wouldn't have known that these letters were going to be saved, but still, okay. yeah, yeah, okay. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so sometimes she would get mad at them and write to Teddy instead. Sometimes she would draw <laughs> Teddy. Sometimes she would draw Teddy. Now, I was pretty sure she said, they said it was a hat that had the stars on it, but on this you see he has a collar with the stars on it. 
This is a four-star general waiting for his two non-commissioned brothers to come home by MJB, also for his little sister who doesn't have a star. Mm, wow. So, like I said, I it's it's in, interesting sidelight to my mother's life that I never would have expected. I, I mean, you know, when you know somebody a certain way, that's the way you see them. And I knew her as this person who was the head of women's club in the area, and she went on to become a nurse practitioner and get a nurse practitioner certificate from Johns Hopkins University and work for family clinics in our area for a couple of decades. And so that's who I knew. I didn't know this young girl who, who wasn't sure of herself. So that's what I learned about her um, from all of this. The person that I really wanted, other than my mother, the person that I really wanted to hear about was Louis Krieg. Louis Krieg, but they called him Louis, because there were 19 letters from him. And the first one was a postcard, and this will have it down there. The first one was a postcard. And from his letters, I understood what happened. They were in the class of 44. He was in her class, and in March of 44, 49 boys from the class of 44 were released by the high school to go off to training camp with their blessing and say, you don't have to finish the rest of the semester. We will give you a diploma. We can invite you back to graduation. You're already in the yearbook because the yearbook obviously works ahead of time. Um, so 49 boys left in March of 44 from the class of 44 to go off to training. And Louis was one of them. And so he knew her enough. Again, these are not flirty. They're just friendly. He knew her enough that um, they wrote to each other. And the first one was a postcard dated March 24th, 44. And he says, I'm in the medical department in a medical training battalion. That spelling doesn't look so good yet. He forgot one of the ends. Our training starts on Monday and lasts for 17 weeks. How about some news of AHS when you write, well, that whistle is going to blow soon. And these are just young kids, you know, and they're dealing with all this stuff. Um, he's always asking about Allentown High, you know. Um, only 24 more days of school. I wish I was still there. It's not that I don't like the Army. I like it a whole lot. I'm very glad I'm in it, but I like civilian life better. And, um, That's not understood. And, I, and I, you know, I, I just feel, um, you know, is your brother John in the medics? I don't know why, but for some reason or other, I'm under the impression. You know, and so he's, he's saying, you know, say hi to Mr. So-and-so, teacher for me, you know, yeah, you know, he's always asking. So what I found out from his letters is that he was, um, he was in a medical training. He went to Texas for training, for um, basic training, and that got sent to Denver, Colorado to Fitzsimmons Hospital to learn how to become an x-ray technician. And then he got sent back to that place in Texas, and then eventually in 1945 over to France. In one of his later letters to her from France, he even includes pictures of Notre Dame Cathedral that he took um, while he was in France. And it sounds as though maybe he was setting up a camp, helped to set up a, a medical camp there. I don't know how much fighting was going on still then, and I don't know how much he saw or how much he worked in the field. Um, but he was doing all these things, according to what I could read in the letters. And, of course, I have their, their yearbook, so I didn't have to go far to find Louis Craig. And he looks like a good guy. He looks like a fun guy. He's a swell friend, and he's a swell <laughs> friend. Be sure you use that word today or tomorrow. A swell friend and an all-around good fellow. And he really looks like they were in National Honor Society together. So I really wanted to find Louis Craig's. Uh, family because I thought we would have the most in common of all. Uh, I mean, maybe that's thinking too much. But 
so I didn't find him at first. I didn't find an obituary for him at first, but I found his wife. And she died in 97, and she, it says she was the wife of the late Louis E. Krieg, Jr., so he's already gone by 97. So it says survivors, son James of Allentown, daughter Susan, wife of Kirby Schaefer of York, which isn't too far from where I was living, and Sally A., wife of Robert Cutshaw of Plant City. Um, so I thought, okay, well, I can find them if I have to. I found his mother's obituary from 87, and that's where I see the survivors and that a son, Louis Jr., died in 1974. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, this isn't good news at all because that's something bad that happened if he died in 74. I was a junior in high school in 74. I can't imagine losing, losing a parent that young, although, you know, that happens to people all, all the time. So something bad must have happened. So, but I went back to that other obituary of his wife, and again, it says, there's a son, James, in Allentown. There's a daughter, Susan, who lived closer to me. And then Sally down in Florida. Well, I was only going to figure out, do I want to write to Susan in York or James in Allentown? And then I had to weigh the thing of, do I think the daughter's going to save the records or the son? <laughs> that's what I chose, the daughter. So I wrote to the daughter, <clears throat> and I didn't hear, and I didn't hear, and I didn't hear, and it was very frustrating. And I don't remember how long it took, and I finally wrote to the son, James, in Allentown. And soon after that, I did hear from Susan. She said she had been away for a very long time. And she said, you know, I don't even know if I would recognize my father's handwriting. It's been so long ago. You know, I, I mean, he died in 74, so they're not thinking of him every single day. So I asked her where they lived, and Louis, Louis uh, Krieg's, family lived in a different part of Allentown uh, that was a little better off, but they had gone to Christ Lutheran Church. They were in church together. They were in church choir together, evidently. And uh, so the, he and his, their father and my mother had been, you know, good friends in high school. And so I got to meet Sue and Jim, brother and sister. And as soon as I saw Jim, I said, whoa. You look exactly like your father did. I mean, I keep looking at this high school picture, and he said, yeah, I used to get that a lot. I used to get that a lot. So we had a really nice, really nice time talking about everything, and the story is their father had colon cancer. And back in 74, you know, the treatment wasn't the same, and predicting that kind of stuff and trusting for that stuff wasn't the way we do things now. And within four, five, six months, he was gone after that diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I expressed my sympathies with them. And but Jim says, "We got a box for you out in the car. I got a box for you out in the car." And thinking, "Oh, I hope it doesn't look like the box that I <laughs> started started out with. This is the box he had in the car." And he says, "Don't know what's in it. Don't know what's in it. But because you're doing this, you know, borrow it for as long as you want." Don't care. You're going to see it's got dust on the top. It did. It had dust on the top. I said, okay. Uh, okay. So this was last summer, actually right around this time. And I was getting ready to move up to Massachusetts from Pennsylvania, and I was getting my own boxes in order. And I had this box, and I thought, I cannot move with this box. I have to go through this box. But it looks like there's a lot of stuff in there, and I have no idea what's in there. They evidently don't know what's in there either. So I kept putting it off, and then eventually I got to get this done because I have to give it back to Susan before I leave. So I opened the box, and I was blown away by what was in there. Louis had saved everything. He had saved every certificate of everything. He saved his first physical certificate. He saved everything, and evidently he either sent it back to his mother, and she saved everything, and then eventually after he was married, his wife saved everything, and so that whenever their mother died, 
and Jim was living in the same city. He just moved everything out of her house, and he never looked in this box. But what was in there was everything. He had saved the oh, basic Jesus. field manual that they got issued. He had saved the handbook from Fitzsimmons Hospital in Denver, Colorado. He saved the first aid manual that they were issued. He took pictures, more than just what he showed my mom. There were at least a dozen of these Army photograph albums that had a federal eagle insignia on them. And when you opened them up, they had all these little slots that you could pick pictures. And they were almost all filled with all these pictures from the training camp in Texas, from Fitzsimmons Hospital in Denver, Colorado, from back in Texas, from France. And every one of them was identified on the back. <laughs> <laughs> every one of them. And he had, he had them leaving on the train from Allentown in March. He had, he had all of him, him in his different uniforms at different places. He even had he and his fellow people, his fellow trainees, working with the x-ray equipment and what they did. When he got over to France, he took all kinds of pictures in France. And when I opened one of the albums, the very first picture was this one. And I kind of got this little inkling because, I mean, yes, I took American history and I know about World War II, but my most vivid memories of World War II are Hogan's Heroes reruns. <laughs> and, and it just looked like Hogan's Heroes to me, you know, a, a European place and the big 40s car and somebody in uniform and some secretary in uniform coming down steps behind them and when you turn it over it says General Eisenhower at Reims yep. and, on, and, and it also said note the five stars on the license plate I'm like oh my god how is he getting this close to General Eisenhower and then I'm thinking, oh, the five stars, that means Teddy has six. <laughs> <laughs> this is so cool. This is so cool. He's got all this stuff. And then, of course, at the end, he's got he and his buddies on the ship coming home. And it's just, I'm like, these, these people don't even know what they have. He's got this whole thing of his entire, his entire military career. The ship had plays, or had a newspaper. He had copies of the ship newspaper. In Denver, they had plays that they put on. He still had the programs from the plays. This is all this treasure stuff that he had saved and that everybody else had saved, and nobody took the time to look at it. So then I, I looked again later um, to see if I could find Louis, uh, his obituary. And so, the morning call digitized the, the exact one rather than a transcription. And so there he is. I mean, you can, you can see. It's, it's in, and he worked for PPNL. He worked for the biggest, <coughs> biggest employer in Allentown. And, you know, he, he does look like his, his uh, military self. And, but it is a set. As much as he's got all this documentation, and he's a wonderful guy, and you do feel sorry for, for what's eventually happened. And there's always this quirky thing in the family. Did working as an x-ray technician give him perhaps mm -hmm. a little bit more of a chance of getting colon cancer? Because they did not use lead anything. Mm -hmm. You know, they did not, you know, the way the dentist covers you all up or, you know, the person walks out of the room. They didn't do that. They didn't do that. Was he susceptible all along because he was an x-ray technician? Mm -hmm. Things you learn and things, things that, that come to life. So I called Sue and I said, I got this box ready for you. I'm done with it. Um, so when we met, I said, you have a treasure here. And I just started pulling everything out. And her eyes got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And she said, I had no idea. I had no idea. And. Uh, she said she knew, of course, the librarian in me wants to do something with this stuff, but it's not my stuff to do with. It's, it's you know, their, their project. But I said, it, somebody might want this. You know, now your usual regular public library isn't equipped to deal with that kind of thing because they don't all have 
climate controlled stuff and people who can digitize that. You can get grants to do that. Um, but, but so she said she knew somebody who was an archivist that she could contact and, and maybe they'd see what they could do. And then a couple of days later, and she thanked me. And then a couple of days later, I got an email for her because I think it sank in and she probably started looking through the box again. And she said, I've got to thank you because um, if you hadn't asked, we wouldn't have looked mm -hmm. in this box. And she said, I really have to talk to my brother. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't his fault, you know. You're emptying out an estate. You know, you probably know how that is by now. You know, you don't look at everything necessarily. You know, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe there's a treasure hidden in there. So, that's my, that's my uh, lesson for you. Look in boxes. Look in boxes. <laughs> Remember stories that people told you. I'm telling the story about Teddy and the hat with the stars on it. Somebody said that would make a good, that would make a good uh, children's story. Well, maybe, maybe. And then the General Eisenhower thing, and then it dawned on me when Jeanette graduated from Penn uh, in nursing school, Dwight Eisenhower was the keynote speaker, and he shook hands with all the graduates. So she shook hands with General Eisenhower. How many these people keep running into General Eisenhower? This is just nuts. I don't know. There's also, there's also an, another cool story I forgot to say in, in her letters. They're going to the movies all the time, and they write back and forth about movies. Even the soldiers see movies and see pretty good ones, and they write back and forth about movies. And so at one point she writes back to her mother and sister and says, go to the movies this week because the news, you've got to pay attention to the newsreel. Remember, there were those mm -hmm. newsreels yes. beforehand? Because she was an avid football fan, and she taught me football. Daddy didn't care about football at all, although he was in the band. He, he was a musician, so I got that part from him. But she loved football, so she taught me football. She must have learned it from her brothers. She... She's at an Ivy League school with a football team that's playing big name football and they didn't always have a good football team but they did that first year and they beat Duke at home and she said on the newsreel they've got footage they've got they've got scenes from the Penn Duke game and you can clearly see me and Marilyn and Trudy in this and I'm like well okay where is this newsreel where is this newsreel I got to find this and so I started looking for a newsreel from that week and all the ones I find, it's all just war coverage, and I can't find one. I couldn't find one that has the Penn Duke game. So I wrote to Penn's archives, they don't have it. And they said, they reminded me, you know, there were multiple newsreel companies, and a lot of people, a lot of big cities, you know, had their own little excerpt that they put in. So maybe just Philadelphia had the Penn Duke mm -hmm. game on theirs. I don't know somewhere I'm kind of hoping still. I didn't contact Duke yet sometime. I'm kind of hoping still that there's a newsreel. Now that would be the gem of my mother and her friends <laughs> cheering at the football game. That would be very cool. Now that's the person I remember. That's the person I remember. So look in boxes, find the connections. They're everywhere. If you've got a box that you haven't looked in or you've got letters that you haven't read, I heartily encourage you to read the letters and to look in the boxes. So. Thank you very much. So, questions, comments? Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you for listening. I think it's, a, it, it's an interesting story, and I am so glad I got to learn these people's stories. Because when you only read their letters, you don't get the whole thing. I never would have found out any of these things if I hadn't gotten to meet the people behind it. And even they didn't know everything either, so it was kind of eye-opening to them too. And uh, I recently connected with Sue Krieg Schaefer, and I said, what are you going to do with the box? And she said her niece and nephew came up from Florida, and they went through it all uh, last Christmas and they're going to get it digitized. It's going to be taking time because they're going to have to do every photograph and the back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but what a treasure mm -hmm. that is alone because, and 
you know, there are World War II archives. There's one in Natick, Massachusetts, but when you go to their website, they have specific things, and they, they won't take common, ordinary things. This is not a common, ordinary thing, because he's got unique photographs and unique items in that box. So I'm hopeful that it can find a home somewhere. He was a starry. That helpful. He was a starry in that moment. I'm sorry? He was an historian without knowing. He was a historian. He was taking all these photographs, you know, and 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 the the negatives are in the box too. Five wow. the, <laughs> the negatives are in the box too. In wow. perfect in perfect condition. Um it, this this sounds like a tremendous amount of work. I'm just curious, how long did it take you to put all of this up? There must have been years. No, no. This was no? just in the last year. Is that just right? in the last year, and it only really took me to find all these people, to find those just those five people. It really only took me three months, four months. Yeah. But that's the wonder of the internet. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so the thing about that is, if you own property, your name's out there. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if if you've been written in an, an obituary like that, where they say surviving is Martha Schmoyer LaMonica of Bridgeport, Connecticut, well, then I, it's easy for me to find you if you still live in Bridgeport, Connecticut. The challenge is if people move, or if they get divorced and remarried. Or if they've got a common last name. Or if they got a common last name. And I didn't think Kemmerer was a common last name, but it turned out to be. And that's why I haven't done some of the New Jersey ones yet. Um, it says evidently, because there are four New Jersey guys, because um, evidently when once mom got to college, they exchanged addresses with their roommates and friends. And so, and I, they won't have the same kind of roots anyway, mm -hmm. but I still think they ought to get the letters back. Somebody ought to get the letters back. Um, so it doesn't take much, but I was a librarian and I did genealogy, and so mm -hmm. you know, it was just kind of, I knew what I was looking for, mm -hmm. and I kind of knew what to do. Because you usually, if you want to see things together, you put them in parentheses. Mm -hmm. If I want to see Roy Schmoyer as a name, I put it in parentheses. Although that's not, no. And then put Allentown after. Mm -hmm. and, and no. So it really didn't take me that long to find them. But it's... Um, it's still sort of unveiling itself, you know. And the final story is not told about Louis Craig because I'd really like to see what happens to all of this stuff. You know? it's, it's funny what you said with the X-ray. I wonder how many. Well, I wonder how many other people yeah. in those units. You see, that's another thing. Maybe somebody medical would like that mm -hmm. because he's got pictures of all of his other his close friends in that unit, mm -hmm. and maybe they all died early, too, of that kind of thing. U.S. Army Medical Corps would yeah. have a dedicated archivist that builds the genealogy of all of the units that are part of the Medical Corps. Very cool. And some of these documents, like you said, the pictures, yeah. names, locations, some of this might fill a gap that he doesn't have Absolutely. in building the genealogy of units. Absolutely. So, I don't know Say how to reach again. them. Say it all U.S. Again. Army Corps of, of uh, oh no, I said engineer, um, Medical Med Corps, Medical U.S. Corps. Ar Army Medical Corps. Um, you should be able to find it online. If not, I'd try sure. Walter Reed. Sure. Fort Sam Houston is what, for, for generations they've been taking a training there. Okay. Yeah, it's like, um, I have a friend who's a Vietnam vet and there's a college in uh, a university in Texas that's got a Vietnam War archive kind of thing, and he just sent all of his slides. He took slides while he was in Vietnam, and he just sent all his slides, and he had them right. Thank you very much. And he had his slides all identified, and he just sent all his slides to them. After she digitizes it, she might just send the raw documents up there. They don't want the raw documents anymore. Yeah. Well, it's it's the same way with the, the Marty, who did the oral history with her father, and she sent it to the Ambrose Project, and they digitized and sent yeah. a copy back to her. Yeah. You know, they they might be willing to do that. Yeah, yeah, but that's a that's a real treasure that you know not everybody's gonna have. Right. Not, I mean, 
how much would you guys pay to have an ancestor's photographs with names written on the back? Right. <laughs> you know, how many of us have photographs that we say, where is this, what is this? They knew, but they didn't feel it was important enough to write down. How are we going to know if you don't ask before they're gone, but now they're gone, so you can't know. It's just that's so amazing. Yeah, so it was a, it was a lot of fun, and I'm I'm so glad I did it. And I just wanted I just wanted to get the stuff back to them. I didn't necessarily think about what it might mean to get that stuff back. What's your next project? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Um, I have several boxes of letters in my attic. Do you have anything to take time on your head? <laughs> <laughs> so you want me to read the letters? Oh, in your I haven't done it. How, 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 why did people save letters? Like, why are these letters saved? I lived overseas for 30 years, and these are 30 years of letters from my family. And, I mean, from way back, sisters, brothers. Wow. My mother mostly, and I haven't read them, and they're just sitting there, and I'm just thinking, I don't know if I'll ever get to it. Wow. I mean, we're talking big boxes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Anyway, Corinne, thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Lovely. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Congratulations Always on your book, too. Always a great time Always a great time. You guys are great. You guys are great. Thank you for coming out. We greatly appreciate it. Um, you know what it may mean? It's not. It's not a good one. I can tell you that. Do you follow? Do you know? Tell me what. Tell me your first. At one point, it was impossible to contact all those men. She's good. Bad work. Their families. Let them know. Why are you visiting? Hi, Carol. I don't know. I wouldn't. It's only my accent.